ladies and gentlemen, shall we stand and honour Julian Richards? Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Please take your seats. <clears throat> um, first of all, I want to say thank you to you. The quality of a conference isn't just about the quality of what happens up here because, um, I mean, the, the musicians and the vocalists have led us so beautifully. Um, the speakers, oh my goodness. <laughs> I've been in tears over there. Sometimes I've been in tears and sometimes I've just been caught up with rapturous joy. And I want to say thank you to the band, how you've served us. I love the humility. You, isn't it, you, you know, I love it. It's, it's not performance, it's humility in worship. I love that. And I, I've loved the speakers and the quality. You know, we talk about the fivefold ministry, the, the, the Christ delivery systems to us, how they've delivered Christ to us. And I want to say, on behalf of us all, thank you so much. And thank you, Lord, for the amazing quality of men and women we have, not just the ones that you've heard speak today, but in this room, because you can only put so many in a program. But I wanted to say thank you to you because the quality of a conference is often depends upon the openness of the heart, of the, of, of the gathering. And those of us who've been in ministry long enough know that you can, when you're speaking, you can encounter all sorts of challenges. But what we have encountered today is soft, tender, faith-filled, open, loving, warm, loyal, committed, passionate, enthusiastic, Christ-orientated hearts. And that is why God, is one of the reasons why God has felt comfortable to come and dwell with us. Unity, love, and Trinitarian love and unity is the living room where God loves to come and dwell. It's so it's an easy thing for the Lord to come to such hearts. And I want to commend you and thank you for that because we all know how closed we can become because life's tough. It, life is always uphill. It depends how steep it is at any one given moment of time. We always know that. We all know how, I don't mean critical as in bad, but critiquing we can become because we're leaders. But we haven't felt that. We've just felt sponges, open hearts. Come on, Lord. We're in this together. And for that, I want to commend you and thank you because you've made it easy for us. And it's been great, isn't it? What a wonderful time. And before I speak in a moment, I want to ask your help. Um, I really believe, and I'm, I think you do too, that God is doing something extraordinary amongst us as a gathering. Forget the label, New Wine Cymru, amongst the church in Wales. It's not about the branding. It's about the Lord and his movement and his church. And isn't, it, isn't God doing something extraordinary? I want to ask you to help us to, to see more leaders and more churches and more leadership teams and more people in leadership spaces within church and life as Christians, not church and space and life, uh, get on board with the movement. To be at a conference like this and the network days and the lead up and the women's of the and, and, and the other things that we're doing. There's only so much you can do from a central base, isn't there? So I'm going to ask you for your help. Kenneth Blanchard, who wrote The One Minute Manager, who is a Christian, and he became to Christ because he, he realized that all the leadership principles that he put into practice, Jesus put into practice before he wrote the book. And it persuaded him to follow Christ. And he said this, successful organizations or movements or people groups, this is one of the hallmarks of their success. They have 
what he calls a raving fan base. In other words, people who are a part of it rave about it. Now, if you want your church to grow, rave about your local church. If you want a business to grow, your staff and those who are your customers, they rave about it. That's where the traction and the power is. And I want to encourage you, and forgive my language, but I want you to encourage you, if you see any value in this, if there's any faith in your heart about what God is doing, if you have an expectancy, a deposit of the Holy Spirit through this, if you see, actually, what we are journeying together is a good thing, can I encourage you to gossip the good news about that and encourage senior leaders to come on board and to be here and to turn up and to buy in and encourage teams, leadership teams, to come and those who have ministry and leadership responsibilities to be here, whether it's leader of a Sunday school or a worship team or a youth group, we need to grow our leadership. We need to grow the capacity of our churches with the presence and the work of the Holy Spirit through us. So can I encourage you in leaving this place to be an advocate for what God is doing in our nation and say, like, like Andrew said to Peter, hey, follow me. And you say, I, I found something God is doing. Follow me and get on board so that this can go from this group into a greater level of influence. Would you do that for us? Because we can't do this without you. Can't do it without you. But together, we can. That is not what I want to bring today. Now, I want, I, I, I feel the Lord wants to, uh, has asked me to do something, and he wants to do something. He wants to strengthen you in your leadership. Leaders need to be strengthened. You need strength to lead. It's not an easy task. That's why God said to Joshua, be strong and courageous so that you may lead these people into all I've got for them. And leadership is depleting and it's challenging. And you need to draw on an inner resource of strength within you to be able to lead people. It says that leaders, I've got this at the HDB conference, a little slide that came up. Leaders lead people where they want to go. Great leaders sometimes lead people where they don't want to go. And that's a part of leadership. But it's not an uncommon part of leadership. We regularly find that we need to lead people where they don't really want to go because we're all broken, we're all fallen, we're all selfish. We all want to live inside the areas of our comfort and convenience. And sometimes God is calling us to take up our cross and lay our lives down and seek first the kingdom and live selfless life and uncomfortable lives for the sake of, for the, sake of the grand vision. And it's leaders who challenge their own lives, and those that they give given responsibility for that. And we see how Jesus brought that challenge. And it takes strength to do that. Leadership is not all pastoral and comfort. It's provocation, challenge. In fact, Paul says to his young disciples, doesn't he? He says, exhort, encourage, rebuke, with, teach, with all authority. Oh, I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> I'd much rather be kind or comforting than challenging and exhorting. But we are leaders. So I want to bring you something today that hopefully the Lord will strengthen you through so that we may lead towards a grand a vision and take up the challenge of our leadership in all of its pastoral and, and leadership dimensions. I'm going to pray. Oh, close your eyes for one moment if you don't mind. Open your hearts. Holy Spirit, come and strengthen 
everyone in this room today with the mighty strength of Jesus Christ. May you be strengthened in your innermost being. Holy Spirit, deposit strength now into the spirit, the heart and the soul of your leaders. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, recalibrate. Come, Holy Spirit, and reinforce us. Come, Holy Spirit, and make mighty warriors out of these 300 in this room. Make a Gideon's army of courage and strength out of this 300 sitting in this room. Come now, Holy Spirit. May they drink of the strength of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to encourage you, if I may, in some ways in which we can draw strength and keep our spirit strong as leaders. Isaiah 49, 1 to 3. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow. And concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant. Now the first foundation I would like to suggest to you to be strengthened in your leadership and in your ministry. And in your calling. And we're all called. Some are called to full time. Some are called to part time. Some are called to the workplace. Some are called to the home. Some are called to carers. We're all called. Everyone is called. And it demands courage. To live out the calling of God as an ambassador of Christ. To call anybody, wherever we are, to a greater future and to the king and his kingdom. Whether you're a mother or a father or a colleague or an employee, it all demands courage. We're all called. The first foundation is this, I suggest to you. Is to remind yourself that you are called by name. Before I was born, the Lord called me. Believe it. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, the Lord spoke your name. He called you. He knew you. He ordained you. I know there's a tension between I chose him and he chose me and he says, you didn't chose me and I called you. It's both true. But he put his hand, he had his eye upon you and he loved you. I remember the first time I saw my daughter, Rachel. She was a tiny picture that had been produced from the scan, the scan. And she was the size of my thumb. And I and, and the midwife, the, the nurse, they gave us this little picture in Hereford, when we were in Hereford. And she was the size of a thumb. And I loved her from the moment I saw her. All she was was a thumb size. And I loved her. God loved you. From the moment he saw you in his imagination, before you were even before born, before the first star was flung into space, he loved you, he knew you, and he called you from eternity, from eternity. Even before the first star was formed, when, the, when there was just the Holy Trinity, when there was no space, no space. Hadn't been created yet. Just a Trinitarian unity. He knew you and he called you. And he called you by name. And he said this, you are my servant. Now the beautiful thing about being called by name is this. The name denotes character. It denotes who you are. He knows who you are. And he still called you. You 
can't disqualify yourself. He knew what you're like. And he knew that he could take you on. And he knew that he could work through you. And he could knew that he could fulfill his purposes through you. He called you by name, knowing your strength and your fragility. He says, I call you and I make you my servant. I know what you're like. Put it this way. I know what you're like. And I call you my servant. I know your good points, your bad points, your great days, your terrible days. I know your strengths and your weaknesses. And I have called you my servant. You see, your competency and your qualification comes by his choice, not by your performance. If we do not see this, we will never be strong. Why? Because we will always lack confidence. Because we'll always think that we should not be here and making this call. I shouldn't be here making this call. Why? Because I'm your brother. That's all I am, your brother. So how come I have got to stand up and step up to make a call upon us? There's only one reason, only one reason, only one thing. Because before I was born, the Lord called me by name and said, you're my servant. And in your situation, in your sphere of leadership, wherever it is, all we are is brothers. And we can so think, I should. I shouldn't be doing this. And the moment we think that, because we're looking at our own humanity and flesh and blood, we lose our confidence and therefore we lose our strength. And it becomes a breeding ground for the enemy to come and whisper all sorts of thoughts in our minds that you can't make that call. You can't bring leadership. You can't ask people to do that, to give their money. To sacrifice, to give up their holiday time, to prioritize around the kingdom of God and a greater vision, to make kingdom and kingdom ministry a priority rather than comfort, ease, luxury holidays and hanging loose, Mother Goose. Surely you shouldn't be able to do that. You will, we will never make that call. For the greater vision and the mobilization. We will never cause an army to go into battle if we lose confidence because we don't think, who are we to do it? But if we see, and if you see, not because you are good enough or better, but just because God has chosen you. Why? I don't know. I wouldn't have chosen me. I wouldn't have chosen me. But a day came when I heard. And a day came in your life where you heard him call you by name. And I want to encourage you this morning. And as you leave this place and every day of your leadership life to remember this. I have heard his name, my name, and he has said, you are my servant. Because it is hearing that the faith in our calling and the confidence in his choice is born in our spirit. You see, we only lead by faith. We don't lead by position or by title. We don't leave because we've been to a theological school or a Bible school or had some training. We don't do, this is how we lead. We lead by faith. We lead by faith that we have a conviction in our spirit that God has called us and he's called us to do something and we are his servants. And out of that faith, we live and we obey. And faith comes by hearing. 
So hear the mention of your name and remind yourself of it, that he's called you. And it is that faith that gives you courage and confidence to stand before God and say, I am called. Stand before Satan. You will not come any further. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. And faith to stand before men, human flesh. If I'm honest with you, I'd rather stand before Satan than a rebellious human being. Because at least Satan will do what it's told in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Satan, demons, will obey the name of Christ. The human spirit, hmm, that's a different story. So in order to have courage to lead, I want to remind you to remind yourselves that you've been called. And he's ordained you as his servant. And as you hear, it puts faith in you, and that's where you lead. Many, many times I've said, Lord, use me, not because I'm competent or because I'm qualified, but use me just because you have called me. Full stop. We are called to challenge the will sometimes of human flesh. It takes strength to do it. We're called to challenge people to live beyond their convenience. To live a bigger life. To think differently. To think kingdom. To live by faith, not by sight. To think bigger. To, think of a, to live for eternity. To fix our eyes in what is not yet seen. Because what is not seen is eternal and what we can see is temporal. Why live for the temporal? Why live for that which will perish? Why live for what you can touch and see and hold and calculate and work out? Why live for that when we can live for something that will last forever? Why? And everything in us screams as a human being with... Of, made from the clay on this earth. Everything within us screams to live for the temporal. To be ordered our life around what we can save and protect and build and see and secure. But everything from heaven calls out for us to live for the eternal. And who is going to bring the challenge of heaven to earth? We are called to do that. But it takes courage. Why does it take courage? Because we're just brothers and sisters. <laughs> That's all. Who have heard a call to serve him. And through the obedience that comes from faith, we step at the plate and make the call. Secondly, it says he put a sword in my mouth. His word and his prophetic voice is where our authority comes from. What right have you got to say this? <clears throat> I don't have any right. In fact, I'm not saying it. I'm not arguing a point. I'm pointing you to what the Lord has said and asking you to align your life to his word and his prophetic destiny. Blame God. And point to him. That's where your authority is. And it is continually seeing you put a sword in your mouth. That's where your life is. That's where your power is. That's where healing is. That's where change comes from. That's where your authority comes from. Don't argue your opinion. Call for an alignment to the prophetic voice and the word of scripture. says he made me like a polished arrow why did he make you a polished arrow to hit a target 
That's what arrows are for. They're for aiming at targets. He has fashioned you into an arrow and is fashioning you into an arrow. You see, leaders are not born. They're fashioned. And God has made mention of your name and he has put his hand upon you to fashion you into an arrow to hit the target. Now the easy part of the arrow is the tip. That's your gift. Gifts come time, can come by grace. Gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of grace. We can be born, Romans 12, I think we're born with certain aptitudes that we have responsibility to develop. But that's the easy bit. That's what we're, the kind of thing we're orientated to. And you can often tell what a particular gift set we are is by what replenishes and depletes us. If I could say this, often people say, oh, I really want to know God's will for me and what I should be doing. And I'm waiting to hear. One of, the, one of the secrets to knowing the will of God for you is the office is listening, but it's knowing yourself and paying attention to who you are and asking yourself, what depletes me and what energizes me? So if I find listening to people's problems depletes me, probably I'm not called into that kind of pastoral counseling ministry because if that's what I have to do all day, I will be depleted and something will break. And yet you do get these remarkable, amazing people that are energized by listening to people's problems and it makes them energized. It's astonishing. What? No. <laughs> No, I t no, 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 it's astonishing. I tell you what, it's, it's called the gift of mercy. And people have that gift of mercy. They're amazing. They get energized with it. And that is a massive indicator of their calling. Some people have the gift of teaching. And it energizes them. Or leadership. Or giving. People have the gift of giving. It makes them happy and energized to give their money away. That is an amazing gift. A lot of people just freak them out. <laughs> so, if you want to know the will of God, the best, ask you, know yourself. What energizes you? Have I done something wrong? Yourself with that arrow. Yeah. Am I all right with this, Robbie? This is your arrow. <clears throat> I've got to put it down. <laughs> I was enjoying myself with that arrow. But what I'm trying to say is this. The tip is the gift. It's the easy bit. The challenge is... is I'm going to have to pick this up. <laughs> the challenge is the shaft of the arrow. Because that that's your character and your personhood. And that has to be shaped and formed. Because you, if you've got a tip that's sharp, but an arrow that's kinked, when it's fired, it won't hit the target. In fact, it might actually do some more harm than good. So this is where it says, and God has fashioned me, or he's made me. He's deposited a gift in you by the grace of the Spirit in Romans 12 at birth. But then he goes on this, this fashioning, and he puts you, he grips you in his hand, and he fashions you. And the way the arrow maker fashions the arrow is to put pressure on it to make it straight. Pressure. Pressure. And pressure for the leader is a friend. Pressure prepares you to be straight in flight so you hit the target. So that's why it says, count it all joy, brothers and sisters. When you face various trials and tests, because it is the purifying of your faith, that you may be become mature and lack nothing. This is a very interesting verse. Pressure matures your faith and purifies you. This is actually that we may become mature or our character may mature. So this is what happened. God speaks to you and brings a word to you. It's a seed. Bang. And we get excited about the seed. But the, we, you say, oh, God's going to do this. 
in our nation is going to do this in my life. It's a seed. Ooh, exciting. It's only a seed. In that seed is a forest. We get excited about the seed. The tree in the orchard looks nothing like the seed. But then he wants to break that seed open so that it actually produces something, produces more seed, so that it becomes a harvest. And the way that that seed is broken open often is pressure. And the seed then begins to germinate and produce something and it grows. And as our character through responding right through pressure and under God develops, we then become mature so that we can steward the harvest. Because without maturity, you cannot steward the much. The more you have, the more demanding it is. The more responsibility you have. So count it all joy when you go through pressure. Many, many pressures that leaders have to face. First of all, I'm going to suggest a few. There's the faith test. It's a pressure. It's a faith test. God speaks. He asks you to do something by faith. And in your mind, everything screams against it. But you have to look at the deposit within you and choose to live out of your spirit rather than sight. And that's a challenge. Faith then produces obedience. You have the obedience test. And there will be times when the Lord will lead us into certain pathways where it's just calling us to be obedient. And will you be obedient? For me, the mission to Wales is about obedience. I don't want to do it. I'm with Tim. I don't want to do it. But I will. Because God is at work. And we have a great commission. And for me, it's about obedience. And that's a test for me to do what I don't want to do in obedience. There's the rejection test. How will I handle it when people stop liking me? When people leave me? When they break up? How do I handle it when they leave my church? When they don't want to join in anymore? And they say horrible things. How do I handle that? The rejection test. You see, Jesus went all through all these tests. He went through the faith test. Do you know? He had to believe that God was going to raise him from the dead by faith. It says, according to the scriptures, the Son of Man must suffer and be raised again. In his humanity... He looked at the scriptures, realized he was the son of God through revelation, just like you and I have to. Realized, oh my goodness, I'm going to suffer and die and have to trust the Father to raise me from the dead. That's why it says in Hebrew, with great, cry, with great cries and tears, he prayed and committed himself to the one who could deliver him from the dead. He was praying it through, just like you and I have to, because he's our example. He had a faith test. Phew. He had an obedience test in the wilderness and in the garden. He had a rejection test when all of his, not just his enemies, but his friends left him. There's the loyalty test. Will we be loyal to one another even when we disagree, when we don't get our own way? Will we submit? Will we redeem that submission test and Submit. Submission counts for nothing. Unless it's exercise when you don't agree and don't want to do it. It's all fun till then. Nobody can ever insist on submission. Never says, command people to submit. It speaks to me to volunteer it. I have to volunteer it. And it's a test whether I will, because it goes against everything that is fallen in me. That's why Adam and Eve took the fruit, the independence. And the submission, the volunteering of submission to another human being under God 
even when we don't want to. And I'm not talking about sin. I'm, not, I'm just talking about you just don't want to do it. Don't agree. That see, deep, goes so deep into the heart of fallen human beings. Well, unless we nail that, we can't follow Christ who submitted himself to the will of the Father for our sake. So there's a submission test. There's the time test. Oh, I hate the time test. Abraham had the time test. He says his body was as good as dead and he was still waiting before he had that baby. And then Isaac and his wife was barren. They had to pray 20 years for that baby to be born. 20 years. Oh my goodness me, that's a long time to believe God. To turn up with a prophecy and deliver it on your doorstep. You've got some prophetic words that God has spoken to your heart and you know it's from the Lord and they still haven't and you're so tempted to take your ball and go home and give up on it or be disgruntled. Oh, there's a time test. But in the test and in the nurturing of time, God is at work, working in your character, preparing you, straightening your arrow, waiting for the day where you hit the target. Do you know, we've often discuss this that so many people give up too early just when the fulfillment is about to happen the enemy knows it's happening and on the pressure of long time waiting and the potential discouragement and depletion of faith that can bring the enemy knows it's around the corner and he'll cause something to happen that will be like the straw that breaks the camel back and you give up just when you're about to have your breakthrough don't give up Ten years of hard work and determination will make you look like an overnight success, said John Maxwell, which I thought of that. But then, um, finally, finally, it says he, he hid me in his quiver. So here's the situation. You, you're called. You're hearing that you're his servant. It's putting some strength in you. You've identified your gift. You're moving towards a destiny. You, you're working through the, the tests with patience and character. And he's forming and shaping you. And you're living in the fruit and the benefit of that. And just when you think you are ready, he puts you in his quiver and hides you out of sight. I'm ready. And you're waiting again. But this time... It's not about your preparation. It's about God preparing the target. Preparing where he's sending you. Preparing the people. Getting them ready. You know, you and your field must come together at the right time. It says, just at the right time God sent his son. When the coin of Greek and the Roman rose, if he, he came any earlier, the gospel wouldn't have flown like it did. The apostles wouldn't be able to travel like they did. There wouldn't have been peace. Do you know, the, even the fact that the Roman Empire had brought peace to the whole land through their conquest enabled the apostles to take the world. If it happened at a different time and fired at a different time, it would not have flown like it did. Do you know? God is fashioning you into a polished arrow for a target, but there is a timing in it that is per perfect in the plans and the purposes and the wisdom of God. And when he knows that the people, the geography, the space, the target that he's sending you to is ready, then he fires you. You don't want to be fired too early when the target isn't in sight. Don't waste your life by jumping the gun. But be patient. And if, if he hides you in his quiver for a season, you always know, look, I'm serving you with all my heart, but I know there's more. I feel like I'm in a quiver, but there's more. You're busy in the quiver, serving in the quiver, waiting on God in the quiver, but you know you're in a quiver. Don't despair, because God is busy at work often doing more behind our backs than in front of our faces, preparing a prepared people for him to send you to. And I believe right now in our nation, 
This is a time when God is going to be increasingly taking us and you out of his quiver and firing to hit the target for our nation. This is a day of mobilization. It's a day of release. This is our time. Jesus said, don't say four months to the harvest. The harvest is now. Pray for the Lord of the harvest that he will send, release, fire from his quiver, workers into the harvest. Today is the day of harvest. Pray and go. Hear the mention of your name. This is a day to go for it. This is the day you've been praying for. You are the people that you've been waiting for. You are. Go, preach the gospel, heal the sick, build the church. You know, people say to me, it's not our job to build the church. Jesus built the church. It's a load of rubbish. Paul says he's a wise master builder. Do you know, we say these little sound bites and we never question them, do we? Oh, it sounds great. Build. Cause just because Jesus says, I will build my church. Who does he do? Well, he does it with his laborers. You're his laborers. We are co-laborers. Yes, we know that he is the divine architect, and unless he builds the house, the other builders labor in vain. Yes, we know that. I want to make one thing clear. I am called to build the church of Jesus Christ. And so are you. He is the builder. We are the laborers. But I am a builder taking my instructions from the head of the firm. And I might be a wood turner, and you might be a bricklayer, and you might be a plumber, but we're all in the building trade. So, preach the gospel, heal the sick, build the church, advance the kingdom now. Here in Wales, And there may be a day in our lifetime that we'll see it that in addition to taking us out to hit the target in Wales, it will be like the prophet Isaiah says, listen to me, you islands, you nations. Listen to me, you nations. The Lord has called me before I was born and he made me his servant. And he has sent me and us and the church in Wales to a target. Nations of the world. European nations. I see European nations. I see European nations will actually have deposits of what God is doing in Wales around unity and missional movements that we're experiencing. They're already asking for it. They're already exploring. But I see. So what will the, you've got to get ready to go. I can't do it. I might be able to go to one or two. But there's a lot of nations in the world that need to find the one church expression in their country. Not the many church divided expressions. Who's going to go? Who's going to deposit what God has done with us, with you? Who's going to go? You are. You are. So get ready. Learn the lessons. Jump in with both feet. Because a day will come of release. It's coming in Wales now, but it will come for the nations. It's coming. And it will bring you great joy. So allow him to work within you and get you ready. You arrows of God servants of the king be strong very confident and get the job done let's stand together
just open your hands. I'm just going to, um, we're going to sing a song before we close. But I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to water this seed that we've been exploring these last 40 minutes. To water it so that faith will germinate within you. That we may live with a greater strength and courage. And set our eyes on a greater horizon. That we see further. Because if we see further, we travel further. Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you'll come now and exercise and deposit Holy Spirit faith within every single one of us. That we are called by name. You've made mention of us. We are your servants. And I pray that will put strength in us. I pray, Lord, that the pressures and the challenges, therefore, will not be used by the enemy to discourage us, but we will look to your processes and how you make us into arrows. We'll find great strength and encouragement from our pressures because we see you at work in them, that they will not defeat us, but they will recreate us under the hand of God, and you will take everything and work it for good for our for your purposes in our life. We acknowledge this is a day of release and we say we're willing to be sent. But we also know that there's an ongoing hiddenness of a further day of release beyond the shores of Wales. And we say, you love the nations. And we want your love for the nations to be in our hearts. We ask and permission you to send us in whatever shape or form that may look like, to the nations. So that we may deposit what you have given us and give it away freely. And that what you have given them may enrich us. And that we together as a global church will grow and attain to the full measure of Christ. And we will see a global advance of the kingdom of God before your return. Oh, Lord, here we are. Send us. In Jesus' name. Amen.